Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session. Don't leave money on the table. Five ways to maximize your peer-to-peer -peer revenue. Who wouldn't want to listen in on that? <laughs> it's one of uh, four sessions in today's Peer-to-Peer -peer World Virtual Conference. I'm David Hesekiel, the head of the Peer-to-Peer -peer Professional Forum, and I'm happy to be introducing each session in today's conference. This conference is brought by four companies, all of whom serve nonprofits that have come together to share their knowledge. They are ACG, Cathexis Partners, Donor Voice, and Fracture. Peer-to-Peer uh, -peer Professional Forum and Peer-to-Peer -peer Fundraising Canada are focused on this topic of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising throughout the year. If you'd like to learn about our events, in fact, we have one on November 1st in Toronto coming up, uh, please check out peer-to-peerforum.com or peer-to-peerfundraisingcanada.com. During this session, we definitely want to hear your questions, so use the questions box on the control panel, uh, and our speakers will address them towards the end of the session. This is being recorded. It will be made available online after the virtual conference is over, so you'll have ready reference to it or be able to share it with your colleagues. So with that, I am very happy to turn it over to this session's leader, Rachel Kubicki of ACG. Thanks so much, David. I'm really excited to be with you guys today. Favorite topic, fundraising and revenue generation, so that's always good. Um, the plan for our afternoon or for the next hour is, I figured um, it would be more beneficial for everybody to kind of, like David said, hear from those of you that are kind of in the trenches that are working on these programs day in and day out and that I've had the pleasure to work with on a variety of projects um, over the last decade or so. And so I thought bringing everyone together, asking them a few key questions that I know is on everybody's mind, and out of that really comes um, those five ways to really maximize your revenue and just to make sure that you're focusing on the right things and that I think also more importantly that you're not wandering down different rabbit holes and kind of spending a lot of time and energy on things that don't end up really making an impact. So what we want to do today is point out some things that maybe you haven't tried yet point out some things where you definitely need to continue to invest and then make sure that we save you some time and energy from the lessons that we've learned along the way. So I'm joined by four amazing people. Um, I think you guys saw the info on the website, but just in case. Um, Tracy Earl is with the National Hemophilia Foundation. She's their new uh, national walk director, but has a background that includes everything from Coleman to um, the ALS Association and has just a really fantastic grasp on um, the work that she's doing and the impact that the national office can have with the chapters and um, those kinds of efforts. So she'll have a lot to add today. Um, Tally is also with the ALS Association. She's their national events director now um, and is overseeing their WALK program, WALK to Defeat ALS, but also their challenge program, um, as well as all other events. And so she's got some insights there um, and then has a background with LLS and other really big um, peer-to-peer powerhouses. Lisa Mannheim is the executive director with the Hirschberg Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research in LA. They've had an amazing event called the LA Cancer Challenge that happens the weekend around Halloween. Um, and so she's, this is, they're going to be celebrating their 20th year this uh, next year. So we want to highlight some of the things that they've learned along the way. They also have an event called Tour to Peer, which is a spin event that happens out on the pier in Manhattan Beach. And that's been growing just in the last couple of years. So she has experience with a long-term event as well as a short-term. Um, and then Elise is also with us from the Children's Miracle Network, and we had an opportunity to work with them this year on their Miracle Challenge program, but as you know, they also have Extra Life and the Dance Marathon program, um, which is Elise is, is intimately involved with. So the format we're going to do is I'm going to ask a couple of key questions, um, but if you all have questions to add, please feel free to add those in that question box. I'll be looking at those along the way, and then all of their tips and um, information that they're providing for you today will be in a one pager that will be available on the ACG blog and also available on the conference website. So with that, I'm going to um, jump in. So the first question that I obviously and kind of the point of the whole session for us this afternoon is just to ask um, 
what are some revenue sources that or places where you're getting revenue that aren't necessarily traditional or maybe wouldn't fall into just your typical registration and fundraising category? Can you guys hear Lisa? Who are you asking, Rachel? Yeah, Lisa, do you want to go first? Because I think you had some good comments in regards to like the auction and some other things that you're doing in a peer-to-peer -peer space that aren't necessarily traditional. Oh, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't know that. No, that's okay. Um, well, I would say that you, you don't want to shy away from the traditional because those really are at the core of what we're doing. Um, some other big um, opportunities for us or big money makers have been an auction um, that we do for Tour de Peer with um, our sponsors, top donors, and we've opened it up online and that's added almost 10% to the bottom line um, each year. So that has been very successful. We also do, we still do uh, an expo at both of our events that um, sells out in terms of space, so we still find that the expo is, um, while not the hugest money maker in the world, still significant. And um, uh, the last thing is for us, both raffle and merchandise sales, like t-shirts and you know logo apparel, we found have we still do them because our our participants love them, but they are, you have to really watch those because they can be, um, my, they can be not as profitable as the work that goes into both of those projects. Yeah, absolutely. I think auction is typically something that a lot of people see mostly at their gala um, events or gala, depending on what part of the country you're from. Um, gala or gala events, but not something that I think everybody has been integrating into a peer-to-peer -peer atmosphere. So depending on the format of the event and that kind of thing, it might make sense. And then like you said, Expo is another place where, you know, I think historically we used to all have Expos and over the years we've kind of trimmed that down because of expense and um, manpower to make it happen. But if we look back at um, a lot of Organizations are interested in generating additional corporate revenue dollars. Um, there's also an interest in creating more of kind of a weekend long activity to um, continue to do some relationship building and stewardship efforts. The expo, um, if you you know can again watch your bottom line on the expense items, um, an expo could be another great place in addition to the auction to to be thinking about some revenue. Tracy, the uh, you had mentioned a couple of things when we were talking that were also places that maybe some folks aren't even thinking about right now. Absolutely. We are looking at adding some cause marketing partnerships um, integrated into our WALK program nationally. Um, and these are great. They're not necessarily always going to bring in um, mass revenue, you know, directly to the event if you're selling things, um, you know, the day of the event. Um, but if you hand out codes or, you know, in uh, giveaway bags or that sort of thing that direct people back to um, the places to purchase and then those revenues go back to um, the chapters into their uh, walk revenue or their peer-to-peer -peer revenue. Um, it also can be a great way to just drive some more revenue but without, um, you know, necessarily your the most you know, common ways of raising money through the peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so we're launching, we're launching our first uh, cause marketing partnership um, this fall along with our WALK program and really looking to um, build upon that next year as well as looking for more partners um, that we can bring into the, the program as well. Can you um, describe, because one of the things that I think is a little bit different in regards to the peer-to-peer -peer cause marketing is what you're doing is specific to the WALK program. I think a lot of people think of cause marketing in relation to the larger organization brand or maybe looking at, you know, organization-wide cause marketing programs or general public, but some of the things that you're doing in regards to the sponsorships and the cause marketing and like bounce back coupons um, and codes, discount codes, that kind of thing is very specific for your walkers. Um, so can you talk a little bit about kind of 
how you are doing that and then maybe how you're positioning that with your corporate partnership team so that you guys can work together and it doesn't feel like you're kind of encroaching on their territory? Um, yeah, well, we know that our masses come to us through our walk program. So I think we've realized it's the easiest way for us to really reach our mass group. Um, and at some of the walk programs, we'll actually have presence um, at where we're kind of physically selling them to text, you know, really test out that um, piece of it. But then also, uh, you know, our corporate corporate development team is small right now and um, I'm a big part of it so it's a good relationship uh, and able to test things out and really see what's going to work and what's not going to work um, but overall we're just looking at ways that we can help our chapters drive more revenue to their programs and we know that our walks is where we have access to the most people so to say that we're not going to um, incorporate the cause marketing partnerships on a nation, you know, national basis as well. Um, you know, we'll absolutely be doing that. But again, because we know our masses come to us through our walk program, we're starting there. Perfect. Elise, do you have anything to add in regards to kind of maybe where some revenue is coming for some of your programs that's not traditional? Yeah, absolutely. I I agree with everything that you know our other speakers have highlighted thus far, especially. You know, in particular, when it comes to event-based and finding ways to integrate with your corporate partnerships or other cause marketing opportunities, and this might seem a bit obvious and maybe not as non-traditional, quote unquote, um, but really taking a look at lapsed donors and/or lapsed participants and maximizing on those opportunities. Um, with our Dance Marathon program, it's heavily decentralized, so we have over 300 colleges and universities across the U.S. and Canada that are doing their own fundraising for their local Children's Miracle Network Hospital. And really working with these students who have, you know, kind of full autonomy over their program, so a little bit different from most of our traditional peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, avenues where, you know, most of our uh, nonprofits are sort of controlling that day of event, which is highly involved with our students controlling the day of event. Um, but helping them and providing resources and support for perhaps donors that gave in the past that haven't given again yet this year or participants who, you know, perhaps were heavily involved last year and, and are still on campus but aren't involved again this year. And so finding ways to help our students maximize on those opportunities has been really turnkey and very pretty simple uh, for students to execute. Perfect. Um, Tally, the next question was something that you had some thoughts on, which was the, the conversation that we had about what changes have been made in your programs where you feel like it kind of un unearthed some extra money for you guys. Things that, you know, and, and same for everyone else, but we'll start with Tally in regards to what have you changed in the last few years that you feel like you saw a bump in revenue from anywhere within the programs? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. When we had this conversation, it was interesting because we were talking a lot of about external changes that folks were making um, in terms of their program. Really, some of the major changes we made um, with our WAP program and um, are also having an impact on our endurance program is really focusing on our impact messaging and making sure that we're communicating to our constituents and our participants in a meaningful way making sure that they understand the impact that they're making by, uh, you know, raising funds and participating in our events. And I think that we've seen um, definitely an uptick because of the focus on those message messages. And I think um, it's certainly, you can never do too much impact messaging, so I think it's a work in progress. We're getting better at it. Um, and um, you know, we're still focusing on it and implementing, um, you know, messages to different segments of audience, but I think that that's really made an impact. The other thing we've done internally is really focus on our training um, to all our segments and all of our uh, staff at different levels. So we've, we've um, created some specific training for supervisors of WAC programs and development supervisors in addition to really uh, developing a better, more specific on, you know, specific skills um, on our basic walk training. So I think we've done a really good job of focusing internally, getting, making sure that our staff at the chapter level have the tools they need to manage their program well, and we've seen an impact because of the focus on those things. 
Perfect. Lisa, how about you? You were talking about a couple of things that you changed. One most recently, but another one in regards to the date um, that had an impact. Uh, yeah, for us, the, we've been doing this for 19 years, the LA Cancer Challenge, but the, the big turning point in growth happened when we ident when we moved the race to a Halloween to a to Halloween weekend, it's not Halloween weekend. It's just identifying yourself with uh, whether it's Halloween, Super Bowl, Mother's Day, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, etc. It just gets built into people's you know calendar, and they expect that event because they know they know it's coming up with a holiday. So. While that was a long while ago, I think that's still very valid in the you know oversaturated race market. I don't Absolutely. remember what else. And the other one was in regards to your technology piece and a change that you guys made made just recently, and you're already starting to see a difference. Yeah, I mean we um, we're a BlackBod customer, and we upgraded our software. And while it was a long and painful process um, as any technology upgrade can be for a small um, staffed group. Um, it's absolutely uh, been a, you know, a game changer and we talked a lot about sort of really the need to continue to invest in technology. Um, all the panelists I think agreed that um, it's, it's moving so quickly and you can't you can't dismiss it, so you have to make that investment. And um, and for us, it's been you know very positive. Perfect, Tracy. How about you? I know that you know with the program that's been around for a few years, but you know you're you're kind of coming in um, with the ability to make some new changes. What are some things that you you've been you know making a priority in order to you know see some continued increase in the revenue for the program nationally? Absolutely. Ours goes back to um, the walk platform or fundraising platform as well. Um, I think, you know, we know that in order to, for our chapters to continue to raise more money, um, our participants need to have a system that um, is easy, it's intuitive, it's, you know, works with them and for them and not against them. Um, and our system, um, I think worked really well for us when we were a smaller uh, program. You know, we started with uh, one walk, now we're up to um, 40 walks uh, over the last couple of years. And so we just needed a system that was growing with us. Um, and so we're also going through a transition to um, a new walk platform. Uh, we'll be working with Donor Drive. Uh, on that and we're probably going to be launching that within the next three to four weeks with our chapters um, and really what we what we looked at uh, when we were looking at a system was what was going to be um, the easiest for our participants to raise money and what was going to be the easiest for our chapters to glean data uh, to help them direct their efforts and where they should be spending their time um, and so I think we're going to talk a little bit more later about, you know, what's important in a program, but I think making sure that you have the right tools in place uh, for your participants to raise money um, in a peer-to-peer -peer space is important. I think that kind of goes along with, you know, making sure that your mobile presence or your mobile um, uh, abilities to raise funds are great, too, because we know this is a mobile world and that's how most people are accessing um, their participant centers and that sort of thing and using their mobiles to raise more money and so that's a big piece of how we moved forward with um, you know choosing our platform as well as making sure that um, you know again we are making it easiest for our participants to raise money the way they wanted to raise money. Perfect. Elise anything that you all have done I mean you know Dance Marathon has been successful for for a while now you know, Extra Life is kind of everything's a change because it's all fairly new with what Jeremy's with, has been building over there. And then Miracle Challenge, we've had a lot of changes with the program. But anything that you feel like um, is, you know, some key changes that have given you some untapped revenue that maybe you hadn't um, keyed into before? Yeah, absolutely. Thinking of data analytics and training as sort of this um, spectrum, you know, 
from both an entrepreneurial stage up to a very high-end strategy stage. So Advanced Marathon, I would say Actualized Miracle Challenge as well, um, sort of were birthed as very entrepreneurial, you know, how can we get people to get engaged and, and sign up and fundraise for us. But then being able to take a look at and, and also all of these platforms working off of donor drive, what are our data and analytics? And, you know, Delisa, to your point, talking about how do you make this very easy for your end user, whether it's your chapters or your participants that are signing up to send out emails, send out text notifications, um, you know, using the tools and resources that are at their fingertips and highly digital, highly mobile. Um, but then training them on how to use those things and taking a look at the data and analytics that you can glean from those systems and processes and saying, okay, where did our funds come from last year? What do we need to do to make an increase? And really being extremely strategic about where and how they spend their time with using those tools. Absolutely. I think one other thing that I would throw out to you guys, um, to, for everyone, another program that um, we've worked on at ACG is with a group called Project Hope. Their global healthcare organization, and we helped them launch their peer to peer program a couple of years ago. The original intent was really to try to bring in a younger demographic for the organization. Just like a lot of groups, their database was aging. Um, they really didn't have a lot of engagement with their donors. It was very transactional. And so we really went at this with the idea that we would tap into their volunteer network. Um, they had some fantastic volunteers over the years. Um, that we would tap into a few different groups that they had relationships with, nursing societies, pharmaceutical groups, um, the actual pharmacists. What we ended up finding after the first year was really that uh, those were not great audiences for us and that our brand just did not, the value proposition was not there for those groups. That wasn't what they were looking for. So one of the things that we changed um, kind of in year two of the program and that has continued to be a focus is really who our target audience is. We, we kind of changed the overall strategy for our, our peer to peer program specifically around DIY, um, built it with a more corporate employee engagement focus in mind and then in addition to that also looked at, it's a little bit um, of this in the same vein as what Lisa was talking about with the date consideration but ours is actually with something um, a little bit different where it's, uh, you know, we started to circle around, okay, if corporate is our target audience, when do they really want to hear from us or when do they need us most? And that was around disaster fundraising where they want to rally their troops, rally their employees, their customers, their vendors. And so is there a way for us to basically create or transition our peer-to-peer -peer program to be kind of a on-demand disaster fundraising platform for them? And if we can pre-sell that, that gives us an opportunity to increase revenue. So I think you know the big thing for me here and the lesson that we learned through the process and, and something that hopefully we could pass along for everyone on the call is you know even if you if you've built a program but it doesn't quite seem to be hitting the numbers or you know that it's still the branding is there that kind of thing you know take another look at your audiences take another look at the way you're pitching it take a look at that value proposition because just changing that piece itself um, could end up generating you some additional revenue from a program that you thought maybe was on the downturn. Um, it can actually make it um, start ticking up. So the next question that I wanted to ask all of our panelists was in regards to the, you know, what are some of the things that for your revenue every year that you feel like you cannot do without? If you had to just bare bones it and say, you know, we're cutting the budget, what are some of the things that you feel like would um, basically just be the death of the program and, and wouldn't allow you to um, accomplish your goals or to reach any of those new revenue goals that you have. I think um, Tally just is kind of a follow-up to some of the comments that Elise and Lisa and, and Tracy were just making in regards to changes that they've made on the technology side. I'd love to hear from you on kind of your thoughts on the technology piece um, and, and kind of the timing of that. Yeah, um, you know, we, when we were talking about this, it, it I think is continuously always an issue in our industry in terms of uh, really investing in our technology and making it a priority. And I think as um, as an industry, the nonprofit industry oftentimes does not prioritize technology as um, you know a major investment is something we always need to stay current in. And, those of us that are managing these programs, you know, we're constantly 
um, faced with being out of date with technology and the challenge of you know, keeping current, especially in this climate when things are getting updated, websites and apps and um, all kinds of things are updated every two or three years. Um, it certainly is something that we need to continue to budget for and increase our budget for and make the case for why it's important to do so. And I think we mentioned earlier that, you know, probably half of our donations for our peer-to-peer -peer programs or more for some programs are coming in from either our websites or our apps. So staying current with technology is really critical to our program. Um, and I would also add something that I was thinking about when we were talking about this is especially for new programs that are um, going to be launched or that you're planning for or budgeting for, really building in a marketing budget for a new program is really critical um, to help you know, get the brand out there, get the exposure of what you're doing as an organization is something that I would consider um, as a priority as well when budgeting for our peer-to-peer -peer program. Nice. Elise, how about you? What are, what are some things that you, you feel like your programs could not live without or you'd be uh, just walking away from a lot of money? Yeah, I mean, our online fundraising platform, hands down. I mean, and I think that's probably the pretty obvious answer for everyone. Um, but finding a way, you know, to engage with our constituents in an extreme, like, digital native world, even doing some research and looking at what our end user demographic is, it's highly millennial, which is like a, a four-letter word now, uh, but also <laughs> considering the next generation that's coming up that will be our college freshmen next year are not millennials. They're the founder generation or Gen Z, depending on if you stick with, like, the MTV version of what they've been dubbed as founders. And seeing that, like, their attention span, you have to catch them within the first 10 seconds. So if I'm going online to make a donation, I'm not going to my computer and opening my laptop or getting out my iPad to make a donation. And if it takes more than three or four clicks, I'm probably not going to do it. Um, so finding ways to stay relevant in that space, not only for our current end user, um, but also the end users that we will have within the next year to two or three years. And one thing that's been fantastic in working with Donor Drive that we've been able to unlock um, some enhancements with them that are, are probably available across the board with their platform, but gamifying some of our um, online platforms. So with Extra Life, clearly very heavily um, focused on older millennials and gamers in particular. So when they, you know, sign up their Facebook page and or unlock their Twitter account to sync with their um, digital platform on Donor Drive, they actually get little badges that pop up on their screen. Um, if, and if anyone thinks like, oh my gosh, okay, that's not relevant to me, I'm not a gamer, I don't have gamers, if you have a Fitbit or, you know, if you are on Time Hop or have any of these apps that kind of reward you for work that you're doing, like it is a gamified industry. So considering ways to unlock those things on your digital platform as well as, as an impact tracker. So if I sign up for Extra Life or Dance Marathon and then I get five friends to sign up for the same event, and then they get five friends to sign up for the same event, it's not only going to show me the impact that I've had and the donations that I've received on my online giving page, but it's also going to show me the impact that I have by getting those other people to register. So really, some of those quick rewards for end user, um, I don't know what we would do without those. We'd be, we'd be hurting, for sure. Perfect. Um, Lisa, you had some thoughts too about kind of what just your, you, you were pretty quick to answer when we were talking about this together as a group. Yeah, I mean, obviously you can't do it without technology, but I really think I wouldn't want to do this without the key vendors that I work with. We have been working together for some of us for all 19 years, and um, to do it without them would just. Uh, be very difficult after all this time, and I just think there's you you can't uh, underestimate the value of um, experience and um, familiarity and whatnot. And we've changed venues five year five times in 19 years and gone through lots of challenges and changes and you know fads in the running world that have come and gone. But um, it's the people that I wouldn't want to eliminate. Well, and that actually kind of gets to uh, the next question that we had all discussed, which is kind of where is there 
money that just gets left on the table every year where you walk away and you just feel like we really didn't maximize this or we really kind of left we let that fall short um, one of the things that was brought up in that uh, conversation was a little bit around just relationship building so kind of to your point both on the staffing perspective and the vendors and that kind of thing and the team that you're using but also internally as well with um, your relationships with your you know participants and and those things um, I guess Tracy do you want to talk a little bit about where you feel like there's just especially I mean you're you're coming into you've been at a few different programs now so you've had that experience but also looking at it from the NHF's perspective kind of where do you feel like money's being left on the table um, and that you know if only we could kind of crank that up you know one percent ten percent that would that would end up being the doubling of our budget that we've been looking for that kind of thing absolutely I think um, the way our programs been run uh, over the last couple of years I, I feel like when I'm getting out into the communities and talking to the chapters um, their relationships with their participants were really transactional um, so it was I need you to do some for something for me. Okay, you did something for me. Thank you. Um, and now I won't actually communicate much with you until I need something from you again. Um, and so, really, working we're working with our chapters to kind of uh, teach them how to build those relationships with their participants, so they're more um, than just a, a one and done kind of relationship. And um, it's really about. Uh, and when I say leaving money on the table, like the problem is, is that when you have those transactional relationships, um, our retention levels for our walkers and our participants, you know, is not um, as great as we would really like it to to be. Because we know um, that walkers uh, who have or participants who have come um, and participated more than you know one year raise substantially more money than somebody who is new to us. So every time we let uh, participant, you know, returning participant, um, you know, fall to the wayside, or we don't build a strong enough relationship that they don't see the value about coming back. Um, you know, we're losing a lot of money, and I feel like if we can even retain ten more, ten percent more of the participants, um, you know, I'm really working to show our chapters what that ten percent means. So if they just pick up the phone, you know, and make ten more phone calls during the year, or if they, as Tally said, because I. 100% agree with her, do a better job of communicating mission impact and why we want you to come back and why we need you to come back and raise more money. I mean, I think dollar for dollar, that's where um, a good chunk of our, our you know, budgets could come from every year is just getting our returning participants back and that comes you know, really down to the relationship building and making sure that um, you know, we're maintaining those relationships. Perfect. And then, you know, Lisa, there was a conversation that we had a little bit too around those, um, you know, zero dollar fundraisers and teams. Um, what are your thoughts on kind of where you, you kind of, at the end of the year, pat yourself on the back, but also say, I wish we would have had a little bit more time to do blank. What are some of those things that you feel like we're leaving money on the table? I, I think it's really Retention for us is, is a big focus. We target our team captains um, more than our participants. But there's, there's not enough hours in the day, I feel, that we could be spending on, um, on retaining, uh, whether it's you know, event, event participants, team captains, et cetera. Um, we, we have strategies every year we relook and reevaluate. But um, I know how we go about um, reaching out to them. How much? How many emails are too many emails? How many letters are too, you know? How do you work that fine line with wanting them to know that you want to, you know, that they matter to you and that you value their donation, participation, etc. Um, so I think I think really for us it's. It's an it's an intangible number that you're leaving on the table because there you, you just don't know the potential uh, loss or gain by keeping or losing uh, cost participant. 
And in our, um, in pancreatic cancer, the, which is the, you know, the disease that um, my foundation is focused on, there aren't a lot of survivors. Um, it's the number one cancer killer. So you tend to, uh, there's a turnover in terms of familial sort of priorities um, with the cause. And it's um, because there are so few survivors, you're really counting on family members. And so we have, I think, uh, an extra challenge um, due to just sort of the survival rate of our, of our disease. Perfect. Elise, anything that you would add kind of to, you know, where you feel like maybe we're leaving some money on the table for CMN? Yeah, absolutely. Um, retention of participants, absolutely an issue um, across the board for all the reasons that everyone's already listed. I would say another um, issue that we're trying to sort of steer ahead and tackle head on is retention of corporate partnerships at the local level. So how do we help our programs, um, you know, our chapters, at our universities and colleges that are out soliciting for local corporate partnerships, how do we help to train them to build the business case and not just give them the warm fuzzy feels of, hey, you're helping this sick kid and this family and without your support it wouldn't be possible. Clearly that impact statement is huge um, and oftentimes sort of difficult to get when you have a decentralized program, but also considering how do we, you know, maintain a relationship with these partners year over year when we often have, you know, these students that are sort of cycling through those four-year cycles um, and then finding ways to integrate nationally. So taking a look at our existing corporate partners that we have nationally within CMN hospitals and saying, you know, do they have a business need that Dance Marathon or Extra Life or Miracle Challenge could help meet? And if they do, what are our leverageable assets um, to incorporate within that? Perfect. One of the other questions that I wanted to ask you all was just in general um, some kind of words of advice, places where um, you all feel like you've been down that path or you've explored something and um, you would say, you know, don't go down there, red flag, um, or things that you feel like, you know, you've done, uh, some of the things we've covered already as far as technology, looking at your dates, those kinds of things. but in addition to kind of general words of wisdom, the other piece that I would love for you all to provide a little bit of insight on is your decision-making um, process. Because one of the things that happens as all of us are leading these programs is this idea that whether it's a board member or a staff member or a chapter leader or a well-meaning team captain, everybody's got an idea. There, you know, and and it could. It, it can range from, you know, we should do face painting at every event to um, something much bigger as far as we need to add a cycling event to our walk event. Um, these are all real life examples, by the way. Uh, so when, we, when you are faced with some of these decisions of, you know, oh, look, th this could make you some more money, um, what are some of the general words of wisdom and then what are some tools and questions you ask yourself when you have to make these decisions so that it's a thought through process and not just kind of a, a gut reaction in a lot of ways based on experience but you know do you go through a formal evaluation process do you engage larger groups that kind of thing I think would be helpful for people to understand too as they start to hear these ideas but then get back to their desk and say okay but which one should I use you know, how do, how do you um, recommend they help make that decision? I don't know, Tracy, do you want to maybe start on that one? Sure. I was racking my brain for my general word of wisdom. Um, and I think for me it's really just kind of trusting my gut and just knowing, um, you know, that, that every, you know, making sure that everything I do um, and all the time that I spend really goes to, um, you know, making my program better or making, um, you know, and not spending, not necessarily get stuck spending time in the weeds, um, you know, on things uh, that aren't really going to have an ROI for me. And I think um, as far as it goes with the decision making, like what kind of drives my decision making, um, for me, and I have to remind myself this all the time because I do, um, you know, get to sit in an office, uh, you know, and 
um, talk to my uh, chapters and talk to the people who are on the ground doing the fundraising. However, I'm not on the ground doing the fundraising anymore. So every decision I make, I have to say, is this what's best for the chapter? Not necessarily for the people, my chapters, for the people who are working on the ground, for the people who are executing um, the walk. I mean, there's decisions I'd like to make because it's what I think is right or what I'd really like to do, but I have to make sure that I'm keeping in mind who's actually executing it um, and making sure that, you know, and in, in this case, if it's, uh, you know, your committee members or volunteers or that sort of thing, you know, just make sure that you are building a program, building an event that, um, you know, is in the best interest or will work best for those who are executing it and not just, you know, kind of what you want because, you know, we think we know everything sort of thing. <laughs> we don't want anybody to know that we don't know everything, but... <laughs> Um, what about you, Tally? Any any thoughts on kind of general words of, of advice for folks and then your process of how you evaluate these new revenue opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that when you are looking at um, some of these possible events or activities, I think one of the things we all need to really evaluate is if we're doing everything in our portfolio well. Um, sometimes I think we, you know, get excited about a new opportunity or a board member brings something new um, to the table and although it can be something that's doing really well for another organization, uh, unless you have the staffing resources and just the resources as an organization, um, unless your, your programs that you're running right now are, you know, hitting on all cylinders, you really need to think of twice before you invest in that new program. Um, and or activity, um, but when but when we do embark upon new activities, we definitely um, go through a formal evaluation or some type of assessment process. Make sure there are organizational stakeholders that um, can support the activity, um, and of course, look at the long-term viability of what you're planning. So, is this something that is going to continue to grow, you know, year over year, can you see 10 years down the road as this being something that is going to impact your organization and have a positive revenue impact or is this a short-term gain? Um, so I think, you know, if you, if you can afford to take a chance or to test things out, I always recommend testing something on a much smaller scale to see, um, you know, how it can work within your organization and how it can be adapted by chapters and or staff or constituents. Um, but not everybody has that luxury. So if you don't have that luxury to be able to test or pilot things, um, you definitely want to make sure that this is something that can have long-term growth and um, you have the stakeholders and resources to take it to the next level. Perfect. Elise, what are your thoughts on kind of just general words of wisdom based on your experience and then also, you know, I've talked to Steve um, Ocean quite a bit about just kind of the internal review process of how you, whether it's adding a whole new peer-to-peer -peer program or how to make change, you know, how we make decisions about um, changes to specific existing programs, but would love your thoughts on those two items as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's always a lot of excitement that comes when someone presents a new idea or has a, you know, a new concept to perhaps beta test. You know, and I would agree, test small um, and know how you'd measure it. If it is or is not successful, have those KPIs set up beforehand. Um, but one, one filter that our team also uses in at Seaman Hospital that we've adopted is what is the cost of not doing something, right? And not just revenue cost, but you know, is this a space in the sector that you're willing to give up? Is it, um, you know, going to have a high impact on sustainability for your program growth or not? And, and really knowing and understanding, like, what is the cost of not doing this new idea or testing a new concept in addition to what would be the cost to doing it? Um, and again, that's, that scope is, a, is outside of revenue. So not only, like, what would it cost and what would you um, have in, you know, revenue production, but then also, you know, what is the cost for, you know, the amount of time or resources, energy that your team or, you know, other teams within your company and organization would have to spend executing an idea or, you know, what is the cost to the end users, to the chapters, universities, college students, um, you know, participants, whomever would have that impact and using that as a filter in, in all of the new ideas that we have. So 
making sure it has those key performance indicators one way or another. Perfect. Lisa, any thoughts from you as far as kind of general words of wisdom and that whole um, kind of how you make decisions on what to pursue and try and, and what to avoid? Um, yeah, when, when new things, you know, come across our desk, I mean, we rely on our staff and we, um, you know, we talk things out, but ultimately we ask what will its impact be on our already existing sort of programs in terms of um, time management and um, who who do we have in the office? How will it impact what my small team is already doing? And um, not to toot your horn, Rachel, but we often go to Rachel <laughs> when we're really <laughs> at an impasse on something um, that we're just not sure, then then we would be calling Rachel and um, asking for uh, you know guidance on is this something to consider. So it's a bit of it's a bit of um, you know trusting, going with your gut and trusting your your inner circle and also trusting your your most valuable consultants and resources who understand your business. Perfect. Anybody, um, I guess I'll open it up. I haven't seen any questions that um, as far as uh, that are coming through right now. Um, oh, actually there's one. Oh, someone asked kind of general, what's the sense of annual budget size and approximately how much are you spending on new technology each year? How much are you allocating? Um, so I'll just kind of go round robin on this. I'm going to start uh, with Tally. If you could talk about your overall maybe org budget slash the uh, total national events budget and then what portion of that you allocate. I think it's also important just from a national versus local or regional event standpoint to say you know everybody's on a different system or we have one big national system that kind of thing might be helpful as well. So Tally if you could um, answer that question first and then I'll go around and that was from Robert Smith so thanks Robert for the question. Sure, um, our overall national signature events budget is about 35 million. Um, I would say our technology costs are less than 5% of that um, if you can imagine that. So that I think as we kind of talked about earlier on this call, it's certainly an area that we are looking to increase our um, investment in in the years to come and an area for op of opportunity for us. Uh, we have a lot of things that we'd like to do on the technology side that we have not been able to do up, up to this point. Um, so more to come on that. Perfect. Lisa, do you want to talk about your budget and then how much uh, percentage-wise maybe you still try to allocate to technology each year? I don't, to be honest, don't know that number off the top of my head. So. And um, the LACC is raising just under a million a year, is that right? And then Tour de Peer, I'm not sure what your numbers are that. Uh, the Tour de Peer raised a million one last year. And um, LA Cancer Challenge is about a six hundred thousand dollar five k ten k right now. We're we're only in Los Angeles, so we don't have a, a you know a national um, footprint in terms of chapters. Um. Right, Tracy. What about uh, the NHF numbers and then the technology allocation? Um, I also can't necessarily give a really good solid number of percentage-wise um, technology. I mean, we're in the process of starting to upgrade some of our technology. So, um, you know, right now ours is probably a lot out of whack because, you know, we're making some big investments. Um, but overall, our program um, is about $6 million right now. Um, and I would say looking forward to next year and kind of what we're planning on budgeting, um, you know, I would probably say, you know, between, you know, 5 to 7% um, looking towards some of the other things that we want to add to our program. Perfect. I'm going to ask one other question from Kristen. 
um, Massengarb. She asked a question about what are some of the strata. We talked about um, you know leaving money on the table specifically with lapsed donors and not having a strong lapsed program. What are some of the strategies that we're using to reach those lapsed donors and the event participants? Um, one of the things I'll kind of answer part of that um, that we I've spent a lot of time on is looking at what's the national natural transition for some of our our lapsed donors um, and then also for our event participants. So one of the things that I think we get into a habit of is going back to those same folks and asking them over and over again to participate in the same peer-to-peer -peer program when in reality for whatever reason, whether it's a life change or a career change or um, fitness issues or what have you, maybe that's not the right program for them anymore. So one of the strategies that I've used with a lot of the clients that we work with is really reaching out to those, those lapsed groups um, and finding out as much as we can about them and not just assuming that we know that that's their right path. And so while it's not going to end up being direct revenue because they may not re-register or that kind of thing, it will end up being indirect revenue and really positions our peer-to-peer -peer program as an acquisition tool. So whether that's transitioning them to a new peer-to-peer um, -peer program, it's pushing them into a DIY, it's putting them into our major gift or mid-level giving program, or even our gala type events, that kind of thing. There's a place for everyone. They've shown a passion for the cause. Now you just have to figure out maybe that was a, you know, your event fit the time and place. Now you need to figure out more customer-centric. What do they want now? And then push them in um, that direction so that they can continue to be involved and continue to give financially, it just might be in a little bit of a different way. That same question, I'll kind of open that up. Maybe Elise, you, you had mentioned in regards to um, some of the programs and also even just people aging out, right, of some of the programs that you have. Or um, So what are some things that your strategies that you're using for participants and donors? Yeah, so in part, it, a large portion of what you just said is exactly what we're doing, taking a look at our data and um, you know, our participants and those who sort of age out, you know, after they graduate college and taking a look at how they want to be engaged. Um, so we've found, you know, in particular with our college students, students that are sort of zero years out, so you're freshly graduated, you may or may not have a job um, after you graduate from college. They really want to be engaged on more of um, an impact level, right? So come to this 5K, come to this event. Uh, come and participate, and that's how they'll choose to give. Whereas participants, one to five years out, it starts aging into they want to donate more, and they kind of want to be left alone. They don't want to be asked to show up and work or volunteer at the bake sale. Um, you know, they want to donate, and they want to make their one donation a year, and they want you know they want one ask to come you know from this particular student that's involved now. And um, it, I would also say that just asking. So doing sort of a post-event survey and figuring out, you know, if, if you were to move forward, how do you want to be engaged with? What type of communication do you want to have? Um, you know, in particular, especially with our demographic being digital natives, like if we send them a piece of mail, they're really not happy with us. They want things to be digitally communicated. They want quick snapshots. They want short videos. Um, so doing a lot of sort of post-event survey to collect that data and then putting it into a strategy for overall national engagement. One of the other things that um, I've tried with a couple of clients that you all might consider is every year, if we know that we've lost a group of lapsed participants, the first one of the first asks that we'll put out to them in the email is not please come back, but more of a we missed you last year and we want to know what you're up to. Um, and so then we created a series of weekly call-ins where those participants could call back in and basically kind of almost like a little fireside chat where they could tell us kind of why they ended up not participating this year and ask us questions about how did it go and you know how did everybody do and that kind of thing it made them feel welcome again like they weren't gonna have you know for me like they weren't gonna have big guilt um, that they missed out but it was almost a uh, hey we missed you we want to tell you all about how the event was but even more importantly we want to hear what's been going on with you the last year because we didn't get to see you and then by finding that information out and opening ourselves up that way, we didn't have huge participation in the call-ins, but we did end up having some great dialogue with a few really significant team captains, which you guys know can make or break a program. So I feel like there's um, an opportunity just to put yourself out there in a way 
at least like you were saying too, not just a generic survey and that kind of stuff, but really in a high touch capacity, um, but still do it mindful of your resources and your time um, to put it out there. Um, anybody else from the group? There's no other questions right now. I know we have three minutes left, so I just want to ask anybody else from the group have any um, parting words and or lapsed donor um, ideas that they'd want to share with Kristen and the rest of the audience? Nope. All right, with that, I am. You guys have my contact information, it's on the screen. Um, I would absolutely, if you have any questions, like I said, we'll have all of this information synthesized in a blog post um, on our blog at ACG, but then we'll also have it on the conference website. So along with the presentation, you can listen to it again, um, download uh, this one pager, and that will give you kind of an overview of what you heard from this amazing group, but even more importantly, some action items. If you decide to pursue any one of these, kind of what are some things that you might want to do for second, third. And then if you have any additional questions, that my, that's my cell phone number and my email, and I'd love to hear from everybody that was able to join us today or those of you that are listening to a recording. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. I can't say enough um, just from the standpoint of personally and professionally, all of you inspire and motivate and humble me every single day. So I'm super excited that everybody got to hear from you guys and all of the amazing work that you're doing day in and day out for your various programs. So thanks for joining us and, and sharing all of that wisdom. And thank you, Rachel, for leading thank the you, Rachel. session. Uh, we've reached the end of this session, and I just want to remind everybody that there's another session uh, coming up in just a bit, selecting the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising technology that's right for your organization. Uh, if you'd like to take part in that, please remember that you need to log out of Go to webinar now and sign in again. You should have received an email explaining how to do that. Or you can go to peertopeerworld.com and you'll find the instructions there. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye.